Uh, okay, let's get started. This is lecture 12, uh, and we're going to have this lecture pre-recorded. Um, what we're going to be doing uh, in this lecture is um, sort of continuing our discussion on uh, deflections uh, in structures, and particularly deflections in trusses. Uh, in the previous lecture, I spent most of the time going through the theory and the um, uh, the, the background behind uh, the method of virtual work and how we utilize that. And in this example, uh, I'm going, or in this lecture, I'm going to do a full blown example on how to compute uh, deflections and trusses. Um, so the first thing I want to do is um, just make sure that we summarize, you know, sort of where we left off uh, in the previous lecture. So what we're doing when we compute deflections uh, in trusses is we're essentially treating it like a conservation of energy problem. Um, what we're doing is we're considering that the external work done to the structure, which is a function of the applied load and the amount it deforms, uh, has to be equal to the amount of stored energy or stored strain energy uh, that each member uh, contains. And so um, we went through the derivations on, on how to do that in the previous lecture. Um, and you can see I've got expressions for the external work W done and the stored strain energy U done for a single member as well as a system of members. Um, the expressions are, are largely uh, the same. You just you have to be careful with your notation. Uh, for example, there is a difference between the applied load P and the internal force F uh, in the member, as we know from, from truss analysis. Um, the downside of using um, what, what would be here is the method of real work is that, um, uh, it is that in order to quantify the energy inside the structure, we need a load uh, at the point in question. And so what the method of virtual work does is it allows us to um, uh, uh, preload the structure with a, um, this, this uh, fake fictitious load that, that I discussed in the previous lecture, which we call a virtual load. Um, and really that virtual load um, is intended to be a marker to track the amount of energy in the side of the system. Uh, the way that works is when we look at our graphs of the external work done and the stored energy done, we can separate that into various components and only consider the component, the rectangular component that considers the, um, uh, the virtual force. And so um, we have this nice pretty equation here on the, um, uh, on the right that says that our virtual load times our real displacement equals the term little f big F L over EA. And that's just considering the, um, that rectangular component under each um, um, uh, energy plot, because again, energy can't be created or destroyed. Um, and so really the, um, uh, uh, the choice for us is what do we choose for that virtual load? Um, and when you look at the math, if we want to make the math as simple as possible, what do we choose for our virtual load? We choose one, um, because one times delta two is delta two, and delta two is what we're after. Uh, and so that's really the method of virtual work. Um, and, and probably the last lecture was, you know, a little theory heavy uh, and whatnot. And so this, this lecture is really going to bring it all back and, and bring it into um, uh, a, a clear picture uh, for you uh, as an analyst. So let's get into it. So what is the method of virtual work? Um, sometimes you'll hear it referred to as the unit load method. Um, what is it? It's an energy-based approach that we can use to compute deflections um, in structures. And, and the beauty of it is, is that the method of virtual work or this principle works for any structure subjected to any type of loading. Uh, if you open your textbook, you'll find that there's all sorts of different methods. Um, we have geometry-based methods. We have energy-based methods. Um, and what you'll find is that some of those methods have limitations. So as an example, we have a conjugate beam method that we can use for beam deflections, but it only works for beam deflections. Um, it doesn't work for trusses or anything like that. Um, the method of virtual work is the only method that works for any structure uh, or any type of loading. Well, actually, let, let, me, let me qualify that statement. There are other methods, but for elementary structural analysis, I'd argue it's the most straightforward method that's universal. Um, uh, so how does it work? Um, let's go back to our uh, example, and I and I brought this up in our previous lecture, um, but I want to go through this uh, in in some detail. Um, and I'm using this truss because we've actually analyzed this truss in class before. Um, so I have this truss, and I have a series of loads on it, and we're going to develop a goal here for this example. Let's say our goal is to determine the vertical deflection uh, at joint B. So we have joint B, for example. We've got this. 20 kip load uh, applied right here. So the question is how much load uh, is applied to, uh, uh, to joint B. Um, now a couple of things. Um, before, um, all we would be given is just the truss, the loads, and the boundary conditions, and, and analyze. Uh, in order to um, assess deflections, we need more data. 
Um, so you'll notice that in addition to the trust dimensions and the loads and all that, you're being given data about each member. You're being given each member's cross-sectional area, and you're also being told that each member is made of aluminum, uh, and aluminum has a Young's modulus or an elastic modulus of 10,000 KSI. Uh, so in order to assess deflections, the material properties need to be part of the, the discussion. And so here you, you, you've been given that, that data for each member. Um, and that's going to be... Um, uh, 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 that data is either going to be necessary or it's going to be something that you're solved for, but it's got to be part of the problem uh, when we're looking at deflections. Um, so our first step is to determine the real internal forces inside the structure, and that's just analyzing the truss. Okay, So we've got here the truss as a whole, and here's the solution. Um, we already did the solution actually in class, so this actually mirrors. This was our very first truss analysis example that we did, and here's the answer. Um, so we, we've got that uh, figured out. Um, now what we do is we have to do an entirely separate structural analysis. Remember, we're using this unit load as a marker to track the energy uh, contribution at the joint in question. So what we do is we remove all of the loads applied to the structure. So this structure here, sometimes we call this the real structure, um, uh, and, and we're solving for the real uh, forces. Now what we're doing is we're removing all of those loads, and we're now solving a new structure, and we'll call this the virtual structure. And so all we do is we apply a single unit load at joint B. Now why are we applying it at joint B? Because that's what our goal is. Our goal is to find the deflection at joint B, so that's why we apply it at, at, at B. We apply it vertically because we're interested in finding vertical deflections, okay? Um, now, what we're doing here, if you look at the structure, is we're, we've got a unit load of one. You can think of it as one kip. So we've got a one kip load applied at B, and it's applied downwards. Why downwards? Well, we know it's vertical because we're interested in vertical deflection. Why downwards? Well, we're applying it downwards because we're assuming that joint B deflects downwards. If I go back to the original structure, I'm looking at the structure and I'm guessing which way do I think joint B deflects? I think it deflects downwards. Um, so I'm going to put that joint load going downwards. Now, if I'm correct, then my answer will be positive. If I'm incorrect, my answer will be negative. So it doesn't really matter about your assumption. Just know that at the end of the day that if your result is positive, then you've analyzed the structure correctly. So now we have to analyze the truss again. Um, uh, so we analyze the truss and we now get a new set of results and we call these uh, virtual forces and I'll denote these little f's. So the real forces will be big f's, the virtual forces will be little f's. Um, technically, those have no units, and you'll you'll see why here in a second when we look at that. Because remember, that little f is just a, a means of, of, of tracking that energy, but we, we chose f, the, the actual applied load, to be unitless, so the forces should be unitless uh, as well. Now, um, you do have to solve the truss twice. I know that that can be a pain, um, but keep in mind there's always a couple things you can do. Uh, number one, if you look at the structure, it's symmetric, so you only have to analyze half the truss. Um, ho hopefully those are tricks you can employ. Um, the other thing is maybe you had um, members in this structure that contained load, but maybe in this structure there's zero force members. So um, any way that you can um, uh, any way that you can simplify the analysis, uh, try and employ those tricks. okay? So for every member in the truss, we now have two forces. We have a real force and we have a virtual force, okay? Um, so uh, the real forces, we're going to take those in kips, and the uh, virtual forces, those are unitless. Okay, um, And so what we're going to be doing is summing the energy in each of those members. And how do we compute that energy? We take the little f times the big F times L divided by Ea. So let's look at this from a unit's perspective. So our, our real forces in kips, our little f uh, is unitless. And so for every member, we have a, an elastic modulus, which is usually expressed in KSI. We have a, um, an area of each member, which is in square inches, and then we have a length of each member. So a question might be, what unit should we use to describe the lengths of, of, of these members? So we have kips, KSI, inches squared. What we ought to do is express those member lengths in inches, okay? So since we've got uh, every member uh, and we've got a, a data point for every member, it's usually customary to do this uh, computation in a table. So what I've got here is I've got a table set up and I've got for each member a little f, a big F, an L, an E, and an A because I'm, that's what I'm going to compute. Little f, big F, L divided by the quantity EA. Um, so it's really nice to set this up in a table. So for every member, I've got a length set up again in inches. I've got a Young's modulus, KSI, and I've got the area set up. Okay. 
Then what I'll do is for every member, go to my trust analyses and start recording that data. Um, whenever you're recording that data, it's customary to record the tensile forces as positive. You, you actually could take the compressive forces as positive and you'd actually get the same answer as long as you're consistent. Um, but uh, I think it's easier just assume tensile forces are, are positive. So anytime you have a positive number in the little f or big F columns, it corresponds to a tensile force. Uh, and then for each row, so for row A, B, take the first, the, the 0 0.0375 times 24.675 times 144 divided by the quantity 10,000 times 4. So little f, big F, L divided by EA. Little f, big F, L divided by EA. And da, 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 da. Um, go through that with each row. And then at the very end, sum the uh, quantities at the bottom. So hopefully you're kind of saying this is a very repetitive calculation. And it's very tabular. So Excel would be very uh, friendly here to set that up. And we're going to do that in our example here in a bit. Uh, and then you sum that up and you get 0 0.237. Well, that sum, because of our choice of uh, the unit load being one, that sum is in fact our deflection that we're interested in. Now, if you'll notice, each of the energy terms came out as positive and then our final answer came out as positive. What that means is that we um, assumed a downward deflection and all of our uh, uh, all of our um, terms sum to a positive answer, that means that our assumption was valid. So we have a deflection at joint B in the Y direction of 0 0.237 inches because we've got everything in kips and inches and because it's positive, the deflection is in fact downwards. And that's it. That's the, that's the answer. So um, while there's a lot of, I'd say theory and, you know, uh, um, uh, 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 underlying background technical data, the actual method uh, is pretty easy to employ. Um, and just to make sure that we're all clear, um, I want to go through an example. And so in this uh, example, we're going to compute, let me pull up the notebook here. Um, in this example, we're going to compute the vertical deflection at joint C and then the horizontal deflection uh, at joint B. Okay, so what, uh, what we've got here uh, is a situation where we're actually going to have to solve for three um, three uh, 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 deflections. Or sorry, sorry, we're going to have to solve for three trusses. So we're going to do the real structure, but we're actually going to do two different virtual structures. So we're going to take our time with that, but I want to make sure that part um, uh, is, is, is fairly consistent. So let me go ahead uh, and get this pulled up. All right. Apologies, I had to restart the recording and get my driver reinstalled for my tablet, but everything should be good to go now. Okay, so uh, we're going to analyze uh, this truss uh, in order to determine the vertical deflection at joint C and the horizontal deflection at joint B. Uh, in order to do that, we're going to have to analyze the truss a, a total of three times. Um, one real structure and then two virtual structures, but the good news is that... Um, uh, we'll be able to use the real structure uh, results twice um, for each deflection. But the other thing is that um, uh, the other uh, uh, benefit is that the structure is very small uh, and we might be able to utilize our knowledge of zero force member identification uh, and what have you uh, to make the analysis uh, a little easier. Uh, so let's go ahead and get into that. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, let me scroll down a little bit here. Uh, and I'm going to do this. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to sort of like split the screen kind of like this. Let me scroll down just a little bit more. Give myself as much room as I can. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to do two uh, analyses. Okay. So I'm going to over here do the real analysis. And I'm going to denote these with capital F's. Uh, and then over here, I'm going to do a virtual analysis. And we'll denote these with the little uh, f. Now over here, what we're going to do is we're going to analyze the vertical deflection at C. Okay, so we'll do, we'll do that one over here uh, first. Um, but like I said, we're, we're going to have to analyze the real structure. So let's go ahead and do that first. So let's um, put the real structure over here. So let's draw this out. Okay. And got a number like this. Uh, and I believe that member is at a three to four slope ratio. 
Okay. Um, we have a 60 kip load here, an 80 kip load here. Um, we have a roller here, and we have we have that there. Okay. Let's put some dimensions on this. So let's say this is we have this at six feet. And we have this dimension here as eight feet. Okay. And then finally we'll name our joints. This is D, C, uh, B, and A. Okay. All right. So we need to analyze the structure. So let's let's go through a couple of things. So first off, um, we need to recognize we're going to have a vertical reaction right here. Let's call that dy. Um, and we're going to have uh, horizontal reactions at D and C. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that these applied loads 60 and 80 are going to want to cause, uh, I think, clockwise rotation. So I think the combination of this and this, um, I think those need to cause counterclockwise rotation in the other direction. So we'll, we'll assume these go in this direction. So we'll call this 120 kit, or sorry, whoop. I'm getting ahead of myself because that's actually the answer. Huh? Um, it ends up being 120, but but um, we'll solve for it. So A and then AX. Okay. Now, before I go any further, um, I want to recognize two things. Okay. Um, the first thing I want to recognize is that when it's all said and done, that's going to be a zero force member. Now, how did I determine that? If you look at joint C, joint C is going to tell you that you have horizontal uh, you, you have a horizontal load applied at uh, joint C, a 60 kip load to the right. Um, and you have a horizontal and a vertical member. There are no vertical forces, so that has to be a zero force member. Also, um, we can look at that and see that if we look at joint C, so like let's just look at joint C, we have 60 kips. Well, that has to be zero and that has to be 60 kips. So we can look at this and say 60 kips in tension. Uh, without really having to do a lot of math. Um, the other thing that we can do is we can recognize this is a zero force member as well. And the way that I can determine that is look at joint A. Joint A, it's kind of the same story. So if I have AX going to the right, I have to have AX going to the left. Uh, and then there's no vertical uh, forces on joint A. So that vertical member is zero force. So without really even doing any analysis, um, any major analysis, I have three members solved. And I kind of have four because I know that AB is going to be in compression. And I know it's going to contain whatever the horizontal reaction uh, at A is. So it's kind of nice that, that um, when you employ those zero force member rules. Okay. So first thing I'm going to do, I'm gonna, now that I've got that done, I'm going to solve for the reactions. So I'm going to deal with some of the forces in the y direction first, um, because what that tells me is that if I have 80 kips going down, then dy needs to be 80 kips going up. So this is 80 kips, okay? Um, and now what I'm gonna do is uh, I'm gonna sum moments, um, let's sum moments, let's do that at D. Let's sum moments at D to determine the horizontal reaction at A. Okay, so I have AX, times eight feet, going this way. Uh, the horizontal load at C does not generate moments. That goes right through D. Um, but I do have 80 kips times six feet. Um, from that, a load at B. So. so that's the only thing I've got going on from some of moments perspective. So 480 foot kips is AX times eight feet. So AX is going to be 60 kips, which is 60 kips uh, going to the right. So this is 60 kips. So if that's 60 kips, then AB, that, that joint A analysis says this is 60 kips to the left, and that's going to be in compression because all I'm doing there is I'm looking at this joint. Here's the members. I've got... Um, 60 kips, right? So that means that's zero and that's 60 kips. So it's 60 kips in compression. So again, those zero force rules can make the analysis uh, go really, really fast. Um, and then finally, 
um, if I sum forces in the x direction. So what do I have going on? I've got AX is 60 kips to the right, and I have 60 kips to the right at joint C. So that means that DX has to be 120 kips to the left. And I, I forgot to put an arrow on that one. Okay, so this is 120 kips. Okay, so now the, the structure is pretty much solved for. Um, the only thing left to do is figure out that diagonal. Um, and what I'm going to do for that is I'm going to analyze joint B. Sorry, joint B. And so if I look at joint B, I have that, that, and that. Uh, let's see if I can do better with that. So I have 80 kips. Okay, I have this is a zero force member. And I have that is 60 kips in compression. So what that tells me is that has to be 80 kips up. That has to be 60 kips to the right. Uh, and again, I did that looking at each element independently. Um, so the arrows are facing the right way because they're both in tension. Uh, and then the ratio of 80 to 60 matches the ratio of 4 to 3. So that means this is another check that this uh, member is in fact correct. So the only thing I have to do is say, okay, BD is the square root of 60 kips squared plus 80 kips squared. Um, and I can do that math in my head. That's 100 kips. And that's going to be in tension. And boom, this truss is solved. So um, the real structure is solved, and we've got all of the forces inside all of our members, um, AB, DC, the two verticals, and then the 100 kips uh, diagonal. So there you go. Structure solved. Okay, so that's the real structure. So unfortunately, now we got to do it again for the virtual structure. So I'm going to draw another truss over here. Okay. Um, let me move this down a little bit. We've got our diagonal member right here. Okay. So this is D, this is C, this is A, B. Again, this dimension here, 8 feet. We have our that. We have that. Okay. Uh, oh, I need to put my dimension here. So this is six foot. Okay. So whenever we're analyzing the virtual structure, we remove all of the structures that are initially present on the structure. Let me put my four, three there so I have that. Um, we remove all the, the loads that are initially present on the structure, and we will pre re 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 replace it with a single load. So I am interested in finding the deflection at C, so I place a load at C. I'm interested in vertical deflection, so I place a vertical load. The magnitude of that load is one, and now I have to assume a direction. Now, if I look at the real structure, I think when it's all said and done, that 60 kip load and that 80 kip load, I think it's gonna cause joint C to deflect downwards. So I'm gonna assume downwards. Um, if I get the incorrect answer, or if I get a negative answer, it, it doesn't mean that you know, it's incorrect. It just means that instead of deflecting downwards, it's deflecting upwards. Um, okay, so now we have to analyze the truss again. Now, before we do that, let's see if we can make our lives a little easier with some zero force member assessment. So I propose that's going to be a zero force member, okay? Because if I, if I look at joint C, so here's joint C. That's down, which means... That's going to be up, and that's zero. So if that's the case, that also means that this is 1.0 in compression. So that member solved. Um, what else do I got going on? Well, if I look at joint A again, zero force member. So that one's uh, same story as it was before. Joint A, if I look at joint A, I'm going to have some reaction here. All right, let's just say for the sake of discussion, it's facing that way. So I have a force facing that way and that zero. Again, zero force member assessment makes our life a lot easier. So I've got three of the five members solved and I really didn't have to do all that much. Okay, 
But I do need to do a little bit of work to get the rest. So, um, so let's see. Well, actually, let's let's take a look at this. Do I really need reactions to solve this truss? Um, this is an interesting. Let's t let's take a step back. I need to get the forces in every member of this truss, and I've got the forces in three members. Can I get the force in the remaining two members without analyzing uh, the structure? I think I can, and I think I can do that by analyzing joint B. Let's go ahead and do that. Let's let's see what happens. So here's joint B. I have this, this, and this. And this is a, oops, sorry, backwards, four to three slip ratio. Hmm. So I'm getting that joint B, so let's see, this vertical member's in compression. So that's gonna be one and zero. Okay, so then I'm gonna have a vertical component here and a horizontal component here. I bet if I sum forces in the y direction, I'm getting that B, D, Y has got to be one acting upwards. Hmm. Okay, let's see there. So the slope ratio tells me, what about the, okay, so what do I do with that slope ratio? So the slope ratio tells me that B, D, X is to three as B, D, Y is to four, so therefore BDX is three quarters of BDY, so that's three quarters. Huh, interesting. So this is three quarters, and then I can sum forces in the X direction. So summing forces in the X direction, I get that, uh, sorry, AB, is three quarters that way. Interesting. So this is gonna be three quarters in compression. And then I need to solve for the diagonal and I can solve for that diagonal now just using a little bit of trig and saying, okay, BD is the square root of one squared plus three quarters squared. And when you do the math, you're gonna get five quarters or 1.25, and that's in tension. So interesting. So this truss actually afforded us a very unique opportunity because the truss is in fact um, cantilevered we were actually able to just use the joints and solve for all the members without the reactions. Um, and I just wanted to throw that out there as a potential option. There's nothing wrong with that. We, you know, by default, I'm, I usually tell students to go ahead and solve for the reactions because more often than not, you need them. But in this case, I didn't. I just looked at the structure, did some zero force member analysis and one joint analysis, and I had the forces in every member. So kind of, kind of nifty stuff. Okay, so now um, I want to just take stock of where we're at. So if I look at the truss, for every member, I have a real force in every member, and I have a virtual force in every member associated with my um, uh, um, uh, uh, vertical deflection at Z virtual, uh, or vertical deflection at C virtual analysis. So now we can apply the method of virtual work. Okay. So if we want to find the deflection at C, and we'll say deflection at CY, we need to sum up our little f, big F L over EA terms for every member in the truss. Okay, and so I'm lazy, and I'm going to break out some Excel to do that for me. So let's let's look at some Excel. Okay, so I have a, an Excel sheet right here. So let's let's break out a little table. Okay. Okay, so member, okay, we've got um, five members in the structure, so let's list this out. So we have, uh, let's see, A, B, we'll do C, D, um, we'll do um, A, D, B, C, and B, D. So if you're wondering why I'm doing it in this order, so what I'm saying is these are the horizontal, or, whoop. so that's a horizontal, that's a horizontal, that's a vertical, that's a vertical, and that's a diagonal. So if you're wondering why I'm doing it in, in that order, um, that's why. Okay, 
And so what I'm going to need now is um, a little F column, a big F column, an L column, an E column, and an A column, and then a, you know, one of those columns. Okay. Now let's, um, let's make these, let's, let's, oh, whoop, sorry. Let's, um, let's go here and there we go. Let's make sure we indicate our units here. So F is not going to have any, the little F is not going to have any units at all. That one's going to be in kips. This one's going to need to be in inches because this is going to be in KSI. Oop. This was going to be in that. And by the way, if you're wondering how I'm doing this solely with my keyboard, when you hit F2, it goes into edit of a cell. So, so little Excel trick for you. Let's make that column a little bigger. Okay. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to um, fill in some of the simple columns. So I'm, I'm going to do it in a little bit of a different order. But um, in the problem, we were told um, that every member, let's go back to our structure. So we were told in our problem that every member um, is made of steel and all of the members, so all the members have an E value of 29,000. The horizontals and the verticals all have two areas of two square inches except for the diagonal, which has uh, 1. Um, 1.5. So, so, there we go. And there we go. All right, so um, the lengths, the, um, the horizontals are six feet. So make sure you convert that. Um, the verticals are eight feet. So do that. And for the diagonal, so we'll use the Pythagorean theorem, but then um, sorry, multiply by 12 at the very end, we get 120. Okay. Now let's uh, type in our real structural analysis. So what did we get? This one was 60 in compression, so we'll make it negative. This is 60 in tension. Uh, this is uh, zero and zero, and this is um, 100. And then finally, for our virtual structure, we got that this was negative three quarters. Um, this is... Um, let me see, zero, zero. This is negative one because it's in compression. And this is equals positive five quarters because it's in tension. Okay. And then the only thing we have left to do is say negative F, or sorry, negative, equals that times that times that. And if you want, you can you could do this two ways. You can say divided by the quantity E times A. You can do it like that. That's one way of doing it. Or you can say, just divide twice. It'll give you the same answer. Okay. And I'm just copying and pasting. And then we'll sum this up. And by golly, I'll cheat. So what I'll do is, um, let me see. Get my mouse pointer here. I got a lot of monitors. There we go. All right, so take that. Take that table, we'll actually put it in right here. Um, and let's just summarize where we're at. So this is going to equal, so what did we get? We got positive 0 0.40. And, and I usually like to refer or just go to the thousands place. So we'll say 401. And our units are inches because we've got everything in kips and inches. And because that's positive, magnitude and direction. And there we go. That's that's basically our vertical deflection at sea. And like I said, very, very easy. Um, now, we're not done because in this problem, we're being asked for two different deflections. So I want to do the horizontal deflection at joint B. Um, so let's, let's do that. So in order to do that, we're going to need to do another virtual analysis. And we'll say horizontal deflection at B.
Okay, so let's see. So here's the structure. Don't forget our diagonal. Let's uh, name our joints. This is A, B, uh, C, D. Let's put our our reactions there, and let's put some dimensions. So keep in mind this is a four to three slope ratio. And then let's put some unknown reactions on there. So, uh, well actually, hold on, let's, let, before we do that. So we have a horizontal, let's see, we have a horizontal reaction or horizontal deflection at B. So let's put a single load right there. And let's assume it's going that way. So I'm, I'm putting it to the right. So first off, it's at B, it's horizontal. And if I look at the initial structure, here's the initial structure. I'm guessing that um, or the joint B will deflect to the right. Let's go ahead and put a load to the right. Now, what'll be interesting is I'll, sh I'll show you uh, here in a bit. That assumption is actually wrong. Um, the deflect the joint is actually deflecting to the left um, and some of you might see that but I'm sort of being um, um, uh, uh, maybe a little serendipitous uh, or, 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 or surreptitious I should say <laughs> um, uh, I'm going to just assume it's it's to the right and show you what happens when the assumptions incorrect now before we move any further I want to do one thing bam 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 I propose to you those are all zero force members now this vertical member AD, I can determine that's a zero force member the same way I did all the others, but with joint C, look at joint C, there's no loads being applied. No loads being applied uh, at all, okay? Um, and if you want, what we can do is we can analyze joint B, just like we did last time. So here's joint B, here's a member, here's a member, here's a member. I have 1.0 going like that, and I know that's a zero force member, so I've got an unknown here and here and an unknown here. Well, what's going on here? There's no vertical forces anywhere on this joint, so that's got to be zero. If that's zero, that's zero. So that makes that a zero force member. And then for this horizontal, if this is one to the right, that makes this one to the left. I can do better with that. So... Therefore, this is 1.0, and AB is 1 in tension, and that's our truss. Really, really, really easy to solve, okay? So, what I, so we didn't even need to find reactions. Truss is solved. Sorry, uh, truss is, is, is taken care of. So now what we'll do is we'll again apply the method of virtual work. I'll do that up here. So... So we'll call this delta B X. All right. Um, I'm going to actually, let me do this. Let me, I'm going to scooch this stuff over. Let's, I'll show you why. I think I can fit my Excel thing that I'm going to copy and paste here in a little bit. All right, so let's bring up our Excel table again. And one of the nice things about doing multiple deflections is that I can reuse my Excel table because what I'll do is, um, let me go here to Excel, let me find my mouse pointer. So what I'll do is I will take this table and copy and paste it down here, but I'm gonna delete this. Because here's the thing, whenever you're doing a new deflection, the real forces don't change, nor does any of this other data, so you can just reuse it. And um, if we go to our analysis, every one of these members is zero, except for this one, and it's one. So, done. <laughs> very, very easy. So I'm gonna copy and paste this. Let's go back to our notebook.
That's what I wanted. There we go. Okay, so same uh, um, same setup, uh, but now we have a negative answer. Ooh, interesting. So we have negative zero point. We'll call this zero seven four. What that means is that I made an incorrect assumption, and we'll say that delta b x is zero point zero seven four inches to the left. Okay, so that's basically it. Um, the structure is solved for. Um, one thing I'll point out, um, this is something that's um, kind of interesting, and I think it's um, it's definitely worth pointing out on the, ver uh, the vertical deflection. So if you recall, whenever we're, we did two deflection problems, and the, the, uh, recall that the big F values did not change. The real analysis doesn't change regardless of what joint you're looking at when you're trying to determine deflections. Um, so if we look at um, the real forces, we have two zero force members, AD and BC. So carry that thought through when you're doing your deflection analysis, your little f big FL over EA. That term is going to be zero for regardless of whatever deflection that you're looking at. So the point I'm making is if you're, if you're smart about it or if you're forward looking, um, uh, I should say, if you look at your virtual structure, you never really have to solve for members AD and BC in this problem because regardless of what virtual structure you're looking at, they're not going to have any virtual energy that contributes because the big F is zero. So if you want, you can be crafty and you could say whenever you're looking at a virtual structure, I'm only going to solve for three of the five members because the others don't really matter. Um, I think when you're first starting to do uh, 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 virtual work or the unit load method, I think it's easier to just do everything. Uh, but the more uh, practice and experience you get with it, you can sort of um, make your life a little easier. Uh, and that's all I have for this example. Um, what we're going to do is I'm going to give you, uh, so I've already given you a homework assignment of a truss very similar to this where I'm asking for two deflections. Um, and I think you can uh, follow this along with the lecture we did on Friday. I think that should be uh, pretty good. Uh, with that, that's all I got. I will see you uh, when I return.